Rob, we're live. Yeah. Hello, uh, my name is Charlie Sharpless. I'm the Assistant Director for Research here at the Anlinger Center. And I'm happy to welcome you to our summer seminar series, New Light, Rising Stars and Energy in the Environment. Uh, this series features early career researchers working with faculty at the Anlinger Center. And if you haven't heard it before, the center's mission is to develop uh, practical solutions for a sustainable energy future through research, education, and knowledge transfer between academia and broader society. That's a tall order, and it requires transdisciplinary approaches and efforts. Um, so consequently, the new light presentations uh, draw from a diverse array of disciplines, um, and they spotlight, um, I'd say, the next generation of leaders in engineering, energy systems, uh, material science, social sciences, public policy, and others. Uh, it's really a fascinating breadth of work, and it's exciting for us as a center to be able to host these young researchers and present their research to you through the seminar series. The series is now in its third year, and this is the first time we've had an in-person speaker format. Um, today, we'll have two speakers who, who will present for about 20 minutes each, with about 10 minutes for Q&A. Because of the compressed format, I'd like to request that you hold any questions until the Q&A portion. Um, and if we have anybody joining us on Zoom, then they can participate in Q&A through the Q&A feature or through the raise hand feature in Zoom. Um, with that, our first speaker today is Fernando Temprano Coleto. Fernando, get my bio up here. He joined the Anlinger Center as a distinguished postdoctoral fellow in 2021. He earned his undergraduate degree in industrial engineering from the Polytechnic University of Madrid and completed a PhD in mechanical engineering at UC Santa Barbara, where he developed computational and experimental approaches to study complex problems involving flows and contamination at superhydrophobic surfaces. Here at Princeton, Fernando is working with professors Howard Stone, Sujit Tata, and Jason Wren on fluid mechanics problems in environmental transport separations and characterization with a focus on microplastics and water remediation. Today, he'll give us an overview of this field and, uh, and his work in his talk entitled Transport Processes in Modern Environmental Challenges. Thank you, Fernando. All right. <clears throat> um, thank you, everyone, for, for uh, coming here to my talk. Um, and thank you to the Alinger Center for organizing this uh, wonderful seminar. Uh, I'm going to be talking about what I'm going to define in a minute as transport processes in, a, in two specific uh, environmental problems. Uh, and I hope I can convince you that transport processes play a key role in industry, in the environment, in nature, in a lot of different settings. And um, it, it can be very useful to uh, study this uh, phenomena from a quantitative point of view. So with that, I'm going to go for... Oh, there you go. Then I'm going to go to defining uh, transfer phenomena. I'm kind of, it's a bit hard to define, so I'm going to illustrate with an example. So let's say that in high school chemistry, we have salt and water, and we have this simple problem of we have a, a, a given amount of salt, a given amount of water, we mix them. Uh, and we ask questions in, in high school, like, uh, will there be any crystals left? Will, will we reach saturation? Uh, what will be the concentration of salt? Uh, will heat be released or absorbed? Those are questions that can be answered by the very well-established field of equilibrium thermodynamics. And in equilibrium thermodynamics, we only care between something that is conserved energy mass between two equilibrium states. The first equilibrium, first equilibrium state, we just have the crystals and the water. Second equilibrium state, we have a solution, maybe a solution in equilibrium with some crystals if it's uh, super saturated, et cetera. But we only cared about the first equilibrium state and the second equilibrium state. Uh, and there, is no there are no details of any evolution in time or space. Now, the same system, just salt and water. I'm going to add a little detail. And I'm going to show you a video from a very nice paper from a group in Amsterdam, uh, uh, quite recent. It's also just salt and water, but we are going to add a bit of evaporation. And you can see what's going to happen. That's just salt and water, and it's evaporating. So as it evaporates, the concentration builds up, and this happens. So it's just salt crystallizing on a solid um, um, 
from the same ingredients, right? So we could ask we could ask the same questions here. We could ask, okay, we have the first equilibrium state with just the solution, second equilibrium state just the solve. We could compute the same quantities, but I think you would agree with me that there there's a richer uh, set of phenomena here that we can look at things changing in space and in time, conserving quantities conserved in space and time. Um, uh, and this is out of equilibrium. This, uh, this, all these transport processes are keeping the system out of equilibrium. Here we have evaporation, but there are many more. There is diffusion, convection, you probably heard of these terms, reaction, chemical reactions. And this uh, non-equilibrium kind of like transport approach can help us understand other kind of questions. For example, how fast does the salt, pre does the salt precipitate? Uh, what is the shape of the salt trees? How does the concentration change in space and in time? So this is a, a richer set of questions that we can answer with uh, studying transport processes. Okay, so I'm gonna hop on to the first problem, which is the drainage of liquid infused textures. Um, the motivation for this is carbon capture. As you all probably know, we are uh, putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, a lot of it comes from uh, just flue gas from fossil fuel uh, uh, power plants. Uh, and one option that you've probably also heard about is carbon capture, right? So we can capture the CO2 in the effluent gases so that we don't put it in the atmosphere. Um, and this is actually a well-established technology that has been around for many decades. Um, it essentially, this, the, one of the most popular approaches is to take an amine liquid, which put in contact with the gas, absorbs the CO2, right? And keeps the CO2, so the rest of the gas goes away. Um, and this, this thing is usually, uh, this exchange, this transport exchange usually occurs in something called scrubbers, essentially a large chimney in which the flue gas is rising. And then we spray the amine liquid from the top and then the drops uh, drop under no weight and the exchange happens and then we collect the amine and then it goes back again, right? So uh, the problem with this is that they have a very large footprint. The amine is a very viscous fluid. So you usually need to dilute the viscous fluid to, in order to pump it with, with, without spending a lot of uh, energy pumping it. And if you dilute it with water, then you need to heat it up because it needs to be at the same temperature as the flue gas. And heating up water is also very expensive. So in, in short, this is very expensive. And that's why we don't have uh, CO2 capture in power plants uh, broadly nowadays. Um, there is an alternate, alternative uh, promising method, which is to use a liquid infused texture. So what is that? So the, essentially the, the point is to trap the amine liquid in textures that are micron size, that are at the micro, micrometer scale. These are called liquid infused textures. And now the gas would flow over a stagnant, steady, kind of like a fixed in position uh, amine liquid. Uh, and it has a high surface to volume ratio. So this has been shown in a, in a recent paper by, by some collaborators uh, in which um, uh, they put a, a complex kind of like uh, maze of structures with these uh, pores and they trap the amine liquid and they show that they can achieve uh, with very with much a much smaller footprint and without the need to dilute the amine, they can approach kind of like the same efficiencies as current technologies, right? But of course there's a catch and that is that we have a liquid staying in position and a high speed gas flowing over it. And that means that the shear, just by shear of the gas, this liquid that is trapped is gonna try to rearrange, right? This is something called uh, shear-induced drainage. Uh, our, our group in, in Howard's lab uh, published a few papers on it a, a few years ago. And what I'm gonna show you is a video of a texture of pillars of just pores infused with oil seen from above. And there's a flow going this way. And as you can see, it starts failing. And this is simply due to the rearrangement of the oil in the pores. And then eventually, of course, it, it kind of like drains over here, like keeps to the, on the right-hand side. But essentially, if you have a, a, a flow over this liquid, it has to rearrange somehow. Uh, and essentially these textures fail and they start getting empty. So you of course don't want that. You want to maximize the amount of time that your amine liquid is in contact with your CO2, right? So um, what, um, uh, what we've also observed in equivalent models in microfluidic devices is that this uh, shear drainage also occurs even in unconnected pockets. So uh, in a microfluidic experiment, we can build very small channels, micrometer, micrometer scale. And if we have like um, uh, oil, a very viscous fluid trapped in these pores and then water flowing over it, uh, what happens, it, it is very slow, but over the course of 24 hours, for example, we've lost most of the oil here. And that also happens with different geometries, right? Um, uh, that's what we observe. 
uh, and of course the, the, you can actually calculate the, the amount of oil that is being uh, uh, drawn out of the pores. So what is happening here is the pockets are not even connected. There is no way for the fluid apparently to go. So a hypothesis, the pockets are actually connected, but they are connected through very thin films that we cannot observe uh, with the naked eye or in our inner setting, right? So we have uh, our mold system, and then we, we can assume that these pockets have, as you can see here on the right-hand side, a film that is actually flowing and connecting pockets one to another. And then that drives the drainage overall. That's why we see the oil being depleted in, in at long times, right? So this has a very clear resemblance with a very well-known problem in fluid mechanics, which is called the lando levitch problem or the uh, deep coating problem also, which is a slightly different problem. Um, we have a plate that is released from a bath slowly, and we want to know what is the film thickness uh, that sticks to the plate. That is a very important problem industrially because a lot of coatings, a lot of plastics uh, products are actually, uh, a lot of coatings are actually done in this way, and you want to know the film thickness. Um, and it's actually mathematically it's quite counter, the result is quite counterintuitive. And it turns out that just considering the plate speed and gravity is not enough. And you also need to consider the surface tension and the capillarity effect of that meniscus that you can see on the left side. Okay. So I hope that I can, you can see clearly that if we just rotate this Landa Levitch problem, this is, resembles a lot to the picture on the right hand side, right? But of course, we don't have the plate above, and this is driven by the fluid, not by a solid being released. But it's essentially the same picture. We have a fluid uh, connecting from above. Uh, and so we can try to apply these ideas. What Lando Levitch found was that the film thickness, which is a very important parameter, uh, is proportional to the radius of the meniscus. So this meniscus that is formed here and over there uh, times, the capillary, the, times something called a capillary number, which essentially tells you how uh, strong viscous stresses are compared to surface tension, right? So if we do a similar argument, just apply a Londo Levitch argument in our problem, uh, the same kind of scaling, and we have some extra considerations about the continuity of the shear stress between the water and the oil, what we get is a scaling for the flow rate at which these pores will drain. Of course, the, the, thin, the thinner the film is, the slower the, the drainage and the thickness of the film will depend on the flow speed on a different on a lot of different parameters. All these parameters we have uh, for the, the meniscus radius R that I've already introduced, fluid velocity, the viscosities of the two fluids, surface tension, there are a lot of parameters, but essentially we can get a scaling argument, a coarse idea of how this uh, flow rate uh, scales with the parameters of the problem. And if we compare it to experiment, we see that the model gives us at least the right ballpark, which is of the scale of microliters per of 10 to the minus five microliters per hour. So this is very slow, but it is important industrially uh, because you, of course, want your uh, um, CO2 capture device to be operating as long as possible without needing to like replace the, the um, oil trap and so on. Um, so this is this was the first part of the problem, and after uh, you know, in one has these core scales, but we might want to also have a more detailed. Um, um, reliable model that actually uh, relies on kind of like the, the full solution or, or the approximate solution, but kind of like dealing directly with the equations and not just with scaling arguments. And that is what we are working on. We already know, for example, what is the, um, the, the flow velocity over these textures and how it's changed by the textures. And then also a local flow field. These, these are just the velocity in the x direction, y direction, x being streamwise, y being uh, uh, perpendicular to the wall. And the streamless, you can see the flow kind of like curves uh, in the in the presence of the pockets. And we need that to obtain what kind of um, uh, shear profile we have driving the oil phase. And then in the oil phase, we can also calculate locally what is the flow very close to these corners. And that will eventually lead us to uh, a kind of like closed model for the um, um, for this uh, kind of like Lando Levitch problem for uh, uh, drainage, and that's something we're working on. Now I'm going to hop on to the second problem, which is uh, uh, water remediation through something called diffusive phoresis, which I will introduce in a second. And now the motivation is a bit different. Uh, we have microplastics here. You've probably also heard about microplastics. They're they're a pretty hot topic right now. Um, these are essentially defined as debris of plastic that is uh, released 
to environmental waters is below five millimeters in diameter, but they could, they could be a lot smaller than five millimeters. And this is an emerging global environmental concern because essentially you can find them everywhere. People have detected them everywhere uh, and they can be ingested by, by fish and other aquatic animals. Uh, and of course, aside from damaging them, they can also go up the food chain and eventually um, uh, there are concerns of uh, reaching our, our, our diets. Um, so the, the impact of these plastics are especially bad for the smallest particles that are under 10 microns because they're very easily absorbed through the digestive tract. Uh, but, you know, uh, coincidentally, um, these particles are also the hardest to filter out. They have been reported to uh, show up even after wastewater treatment. So we, of course, after the water is used, we put it through wastewater treatment before it's released back into the environment. And we still see microplastics after wastewater treatment because usually wastewater treatment, unless the water is going to be reused for drinking, it lacks high end filtration, like ultrafiltration, microfiltration to filter these very small particles uh, because we usually don't need it. So that means that they're essentially the, the smallest ones go through uh, uh, unperturbed. Uh, so this kind of like highlights that it could be very useful to develop new approaches for to, to water remediation that could be cost effective and could help with this problem. Um, um, so that we don't, uh, we can um, efficiently filter out these smallest microplastics before uh, dumping them into the environment. So uh, we think that there's a phenomenon called diffusiophoresis that can help with this. Um, essentially, um, the effect, uh, the the motion, the spontaneous motion of particles in uh, in a concentration gradient. So if we have a chemical, usually the way to look at it is uh, an electrolyte, two ions, for example, salt, uh, sodium chloride ions, as an example. Uh, and there is a gradient of salt. So there's more salt on one place in space, but less salt on another. There is a gradient. And luckily for us, most particles, unless you're very, very careful or the substance is very, very uh, special, most particles in an electrolyte bath, they get some surface charge. And, this, uh, and there is an interplay between the charges and something called the double layer on the particle and the gradient of the, of the ions that make the particle move. And the particle can move up the gradient or down the gradient depending on the specific electrolyte, and depending on the specific uh, uh, particle and the specific charge. Uh, but essentially it moves in response to concentration gradients. And it moves with a velocity that is proportional to this gradient, but it's also, it has this constant here, which is called the diffusiovertic mobility, which is kind of a diffusion coefficient, but it's much higher than a diffusion coefficient typically. So that means that it results in directed motion that can be much faster than diffusion. Diffusion is very slow, so you can move particles around at small scales very quickly with, uh, uh, with this diffusive paralysis effect inducing concentration gradients. And this has been shown in a number of uh, publications recently. These are dead-end pores on which we want to deliver some kind of particles. Um, and this, if the particles had to be delivered to the end of the port just by diffusion, it would be extremely slow. But if we set up a concentration gradient between the, aside from the particles, a concentration gradient between the outside and the inside of the pore, what happens is very quick uh, uh, migration down the pores. Uh, and you can also engineer concentration gradients to move colloids between different sources and sinks of chemicals. Um, so, so one specific application that has also been highlighted is this um, diffusive phrases applied to something called field flow fractionation. And that essentially means that if we have a, um, a flow going in one direction and we can establish a force that is perpendicular to the flow, what will happen to the particles in that solution will be that they, uh, uh, they move by, you know, uh, by means of this force, they move to, towards the walls of the channel. They will pack at the walls of the channel and then we can just divert our channel and they have clean water, some effluent of clean water and some effluent with particles that we can, uh, uh, that we can um, dump. Um, this is a membraneless filtration effect, uh, essentially, and it has shown using CO2, uh, it has also been shown that the efficiency is uh, comparable to micro and ultra filtration with a lot less energy spent because when you do an actual filtration with a filter, what you need is pores that are of the size of the particles, because you want your pores to be smaller than the particles so the particles get stuck, essentially. Um, and here, you can get away with the channels that is, it still has to be small because it's a small scale effect, 
But instead of, if you want to filter particles that are one micron in diameter, you need to uh, push your fluid through holes that are one micron uh, uh, big. You can make it, for example, 100 microns. So that's a lot less energy spent in pumping. Um, also, the, the, the advantage is that diffuser resin is quite inexpensive because it just need, needs chemicals. There's no uh, uh, intensive uh, electricity usage. Um, and also, one key advantage that we're looking into is that you can always repurpose the chemical that you're using to induce diffuser phrases to also treat your water. So, for example, if you want to remove particles but also uh, treat your water, uh, you could subject it to uh, uh, some chemical, for example, chlorine that would disinfect your water aside from moving the particles around so you can get like kind of, like kind of filtration and disinfection in the same step. And that's what, what we're looking into. Um, yes, so this is what I just said. Um, so uh, what, what happens with, if we want to try to start mold, modeling these problems, what we have is essentially a chemical source on one side of our channel, a chemical sink, kind of like the, the way the chemical uh, goes uh, eventually. Um, and what happens when this chemical reaches the liquid through our porous or, or, or through our membrane walls is that, for example, if we have CO2, I just mentioned that it's been done with CO2, the CO2 immediately dissociates into two ions, and these two ions write diffuse phrases. In the case of chlorine, what would happen is that you also have two ions, but you have an extra species, this uh, hypochlorous acid, that would perform the disinfection. So you're kind of like, that's illustrating that you can get a two for one. Um, so the um, what I've been doing for both CO2 and chlorine uh, is to try to model this effect. And the, um, uh, the way I've looked at it is that the maximum efficiency of this effect will be reached downstream when the particles have all been packed. And the very downstream our channel, we only have essentially the particles being moved by diffusive viruses, but also trying to spread out due to the Brownian motion and diffusion between them. So we can write down reaction diffusion uh, uh, equation for the chemical and uh, diffusive versus diffusion uh, uh, equation for the particles. Uh, yeah, as I said, this is just diffusion and reaction, diffusive versus and diffusion. These are just the, the different transfer processes at play here. Um, and we have only three parameters after we have uh, uh, normalized everything, which essentially tells you how fast the chemistry is with respect to diffusion and also how fast diffusive versus is with respect to uh, the Brownian motion. Between the particles. But we can solve these equations, and I'm going to skip the details here. But essentially, the, it is crucial to get the full solution of these equations and once again do something that depends on space, um, because that is the only way in which you can get the, the essentially the velocities, the diffusive vertical velocity at the walls of the channel. Uh, you need to calculate from the gradient of concentration, as I've just said. So you need to solve the full uh, equations to calculate the gradients. Then the velocity and the velocity determines kind of like concentration of particles. And as you can see, they all pack um, at the wall according to this model. Um, and after we solve all the equations, we can also calculate what is what I've defined as uh, efficiency in this case, which is essentially what fraction of your channel is clean. And by clean, I mean, for example, you could do with a different number, but which fraction of the channel has a 1,000 fold reduction in particle concentration, right? So you can plot, now we're in, the, in good shape to plot, uh, uh, to plot how the efficiency varies with the parameters. Uh, there is a nice kind of like parameter collapse with these uh, two parameters here. Uh, and you can have the, uh, also the theory for which there is a, a, an asymptotic form of this efficiency, which I won't go into, of course. Um, actually, you can have uh, theory, you can have simulations. And now we have some experience with CO2, um, in which you can see here is an experimental picture of exactly the same setting. And we are kind of like trying to measure what is the size of this clean zone at the very end of the channel and comparing it. So it's for now, we don't have enough data and we want to cover the rest of the parameter space. Uh, for now, it's uh, a quite kind of a qualitative agreement, but it's uh, a good point from here is that you can achieve actually, if you wait long enough down the channel and you get downstream enough, you can achieve high efficiencies. Um, yes, so we are trying to explore more uh, in terms of uh, experiments, and we're also trying to fabricate uh, special chips to do this. We've done it with CO2, we want to do it with chlorine, as I've said, uh, but that requires a slightly different 
manufacturing process for the membranes uh, in between these channels. So that we're doing right now. And that's uh, everything I want to tell you about these uh, two problems. I hope you uh, it was interesting to you and I'll take any questions. Hi, Bernardo. It's a great presentation. Um, I'm also working in carbon capture, um, but more like capture and transport and storage. Thanks. More than ever. Um, so it's very interesting in terms of the course of the technique that you describe. So, based on your experience, um, do you know or can you speak about the efficient, how efficient is it? Go the, so, so the um... Essentially, this is a, a project that some um, um, collaborators approach that they have the, um, there is a recent paper, the one I highlighted there, uh, elaborates more on that. I think that it's comparable, the, their main point is it's comparable to uh, like current technologies with a much lower kind of like footprint and a much uh, lower energy requirement. That's kind of, I think that's kind of the point. I'm, I, I'm not 100% sure on that and, and I would have to, to look on that. Um, but yeah, um, essentially we're, we're trying to also, I think they measure kind of like the efficiency for like a pilot device. So what we're trying to do is, uh, think about what would happen in the long run, like how stable these, uh, pockets of, of amine are. Right. Yeah. Um, in terms of mechanism of the, because, um, as far as I understand is the, what you described is the, how the components are fully captured in the course, but in how to release it back in terms of like what we did in the strict version. Yeah, yeah so, so you mean like get the carbon back yes. from like the amine, right? Yeah. So I think they do, they cycle. I think you, I, I, can, I can refer you to the paper if you want, but essentially they have these, uh, what they call shrill structure with these like pores and they flow CO2 and the CO2 gets captured in the amine and at some point it gets saturated, the amine gets saturated. So you have to flow back another gas that gets back the CO2 from the amine and then they, they can, so they, they, in theory, they wouldn't need to constantly replenish this amine. Right. And that's what they've done with a, like a pilot one. So maybe this will differ like actually in practice. So you also use, use uh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure. Uh, I don't think so. And it's, in my recollection is one of the main points is um, nothing needs to be heated up. Okay. That's one of the main points in the paper, but I'm, I'm not, I'm no, expert on the exact mechanism of carbon capture. We're just trying to look at the, right. at the drug reaction, but I can, I can point you to the paper. Yeah. Uh, in terms of pressure drop, can you look at it? I mean, again, we haven't looked at the pressure drop because we're looking at the, at the, at the shear rate, uh, just the shear drainage. Uh, I, did, I do think that is also comparable because the, the, their point is that um, it, the pressure drop is actually lower than if you had a solid that absorbs the, the CO2, because there are, you can also apparently uh, absorb the CO2 in solids, and then you need like a very packed kind of like porous structure of solid so the CO2 can flow, and that has a very large pressure drop. But here, since there's a very high surface to volume ratio, you can actually put your gas through these kind of like, these kind of like, um, uh, kind of like branchy structures. And the pressure drop is not as high. That's that's my recollection from their work. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Hey, Fernando, thank you for talk. Uh, so I have a question about the, the carbon capture project. I, I wonder how important the geometry of the pocket is in your, in your model. So right now you basically assumed a cylindrical force, which means that the, the cross section is like a more or less like a square. But then in reality, most of the times you will have like the spheres or like a circle or, or even trapezoids. So I wonder, you know, how important that is, you know, um, I would imagine will be very important. Uh, the second question that, you know, regarding to your second kind of example is that uh, how does the electro uh, osmosis compare to electrophoresis in terms of the scale, the efficiency, because the electrophoresis, you know, even though we need to use some kind of energy, I would assume it's being no slightly more efficient than the electroosmosis. So I'm just want to compare uh, which one is more. Uh, um, yeah. So but actually electro, uh, so the electro uh, osmotic part of diffusive um 
the uh, electrosmosis is actually electrophoresis just with the small scale electric fields that you get from the ion exchange kind of um so it, it kind of depends i guess on how um how strong your gradients are in the diffuse osmotic case and how strong your electric fields in the electrophoretic case i guess that just doing uh, directly electrophoretic with some electrodes uh i guess it can depend on on how strong it is i'm i'm not sure anyone has looked at the actual efficiency it's kind of hard to define an efficiency without like comparing like what you are um uh you know compare like a, how does a chemical gradient compared to a, a voltage applied through electrodes um but i i don't, I don't I'm, I'm not fully sure about your first question uh you're talking about the geometry that's a very good point um in the video i've shown of the of that texture being drained um through shear the um, the texture are posts so you essentially have like a, a bunch of posts in which you infuse some oil and the posts are random randomly distributed but they show in the paper that you can actually get a very good idea of how long the whole pattern will drain if you just look at what happens at longi in longitudinal pores like a very long pores so they did look at very long pores on, on how the fluid rearranges or a pore that is aligned with the flow um what i've been looking is at what happens when you have the opposite um kind of configurations in which the pores are perpendicular and then you just have these films so i would assume that it's somewhere in between uh but at least it's been shown that geometry has probably has a quantitative effect it's probably a factor of order one between what you can see with uh this kind of idealized pores and, and actual pores so it could be i don't know two three times but at least it's not an order of magnitude so you can get a good idea of the mechanisms by looking at these like more academic problems that are more idealized yeah one quick one. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm curious for the second project. So you separate the microplastics out and you end up with one clean stream. And then it looks like the, the reject stream is also aqueous, like you have a higher concentration. Yeah. So I'm curious, yeah. what do you do with that? There is, I mean, that's also part of the, a big part of the model is that you want to maximize the efficiency. So you want to minimize the, the kind of like the, the reject, right? Yeah. Um, in, in, we have not looked at what would be done industrially. I mean, in, in cross flow filtration, you essentially also have like a, a reject, right? That you can like recirculate and so on. You can recirculate. But essentially, at, in the end, you have some highly concentrated particles in some aqueous phase that you have to dispose of. So, um, so that's, that's kind of what we're trying to answer. Like, how efficient can this be so we can minimize the, you know, can make it as efficient as possible or, or try to see which parameters influence it so that we can try to make it as efficient as possible. Yeah. Second, second speaker today is Holly Caggiano. Holly joined the Anlinger Center as a distinguished postdoctoral fellow also in 2021. Uh, she earned her undergraduate degree in environmental policy, uh, institutions and behavior from Rutgers University and went on to complete a PhD in planning and public policy also at Rutgers where she blended perspectives from engineering, psychology and sociology to identify key household consumption behaviors and potential interventions to promote sustainable behavior. Here at Princeton, Holly is working with Professor Elke Weber and senior research scholar Chris Craig to assess public opinion on transitioning to renewable energy in key regions of the U.S. and to identify mechanisms to foster community level support for large scale renewable deployments. Today, she'll present some findings from this work in her talk entitled Building Coalitions for Renewable Energy Futures. Holly, the floor is all yours. Thanks so much. I'm just thinking about mm -hmm. uh, I'll share it. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you, everyone. Maybe yours. My mask off, get my screen shared. 
Great. Is that large enough? I think we're okay. So I can just take a look at my notes. Um, thank you all so much. Uh, I'm excited to talk today in the first in-person talk I've given in as long as I can remember uh, about some of the work I've done in this first year of my postdoc at the Anlinger Center uh, with professors Elke Weber and Chris Gregg. So we're going to talk today about building coalitions for renewable energy futures. Uh, so if you're familiar at all with Princeton's uh, Net Zero America study, uh, led by some of the professors here at the Anlinger Center, uh, you'll know that we have a lot of work to do uh, to reach renewable energy goals uh, in the country. And today I'm going to focus on some of my work in Pennsylvania, uh, which is one of the top 10 states uh, for installed utility scale solar capacity uh, under um, the E plus scenario of the Net Zero America study, uh, which is unconstrained uh, siting. Um, so uh, kind of one of the more uh, lenient models uh, that there's going to be a lot of development capacity uh, needed in Pennsylvania. Uh, you can see here 2040 and 2050. Uh, so some of the downscaled models, and this was prepared by Chris Gregg uh, and some of the members of their lab uh, show this is 2020. I zero in on the Appalachian region, uh, but specifically have that box around Pennsylvania. You can see, okay, there's a little bit of wind. That's what's outlined in blue. Um, not very much solar. Uh, flash forward 30 years to 2050, uh, and this is what we're looking at. So all of the red here is solar, and that's utility scale. Uh, so that's quite a bit of land area. It's quite a bit of capacity. Um, how do we do this? Well, we have some good news at the state level. Uh, we know Governor Wolf has a commitment to renewables, uh, announced recently one of the largest government solar energy commitments in the US uh, to reach 50% of the state's renewable energy goals with solar. Um, so that is pretty fantastic. Uh, and we also know that generally people in Pennsylvania uh, are supportive of renewable energy. This. Uh, MAP comes out of Yale's program on climate communication that does a yearly survey um, and shows uh, the kind of average number in each county. Oh, can we still say? Good. Um, of uh, residents that support at least some type of renewable energy standards. So you can see uh, kind of like at least about 50%. And then in some of the more urban areas, it goes higher. So we know generally people are kind of on board with this. Um, when you look at that from kind of the average scale. But Molly, something happened in your oh, screen yet. Uh, get smaller somehow. Okay. We better? Yep. Okay. Uh, but we have these emerging bottlenecks. Um, you can kind of see that at the state level, okay, it seems like things are going all right. Uh, and generally people are pretty supportive of renewables. Um, but these are all headlines from kind of the past year or two, some as recent uh, as the last few weeks about individual uh, utility scale solar farms that are facing local opposition. And something that's really important to understand here, uh, and that's not typical for the rest of the country is that Pennsylvania uh, is a very local government state. Um, so unlike other states, uh, maybe say New Jersey, where you have a lot of the siting controls happening at the state level, um, and you know our Department of Environmental Protection, uh, a lot of kind of state level agencies, uh, state level planning, making decisions about siting, uh, Pennsylvania has a lot of home rule municipalities, um, and mostly the decisions are falling at that municipal level, um, which makes things quite difficult uh, in the way that they're so decentralized. Um, so you can see here just individual projects um, where this North Anvil project was denied uh, by a planning board um, uh, at different um, local level hearings. Uh, so there is citizen engagement, people are getting involved, uh, but we're hitting bottlenecks um, when it comes to a widespread kind of coordinated energy transition uh, that all of our modeling studies say that we need. So we need to build solar capacity, right? We know that. 
Uh, but building solar capacity also requires building civic capacity and building government capacity, uh, which is something I'm arguing that Pennsylvania uh, needs a lot of work in in this government capacity, at least. Um, so we know I've talked about that this happens uh, almost entirely at the local level through county zoning and planning ordinances. Uh, and there's a recent study uh, unpublished on the second point by some uh, legal scholars at University of Pennsylvania that they just presented uh, in a state level uh, Senate hearing that shows about 87% and they looked at I think about 2500 uh, local ordinances in Pennsylvania uh, have absolutely no guidance on solar whatsoever. Um, some of these I think it was about 13% provide some regulation or some guidance on a uh, household on rooftop solar PV, uh, but only 5% out of all of these uh, ordinances uh, have any kind of regulation on utility scale solar. And some of these had to do uh, with setbacks uh, or vegetation, um, you know, kind of somewhat aesthetic things, uh, but very little in the way uh, of when we're talking about conditional use permits, which is what developers need to get to actually uh, build and do the project. Um, so one reading of this might be for a developer, okay, there's less red tape. Um, you know, we uh, like, let's go in and do this. But in reality, the way that this usually plays out um, is that there's a lot of uncertainty uh, and uncertainty means time and uncertainty means, means money. Um, so there are quite, uh, a lot of soft costs that go into that uncertainty, you know, hiring legal teams, trying to negotiate, trying to figure out, um, you know, not having that clear guidance uh, of what is allowed and what's not allowed and where can we build and where can't we build. Um, so ordinances here are then often passed at the local level as a reaction to development. Uh, so, you know, maybe in a neighboring county uh, or maybe, or in a neighboring municipality uh, or in the, a municipality where there starts to be talk uh, of some solar development, then maybe an ordinance is kind of hastily put together. Uh, and that's what we're kind of starting to see, uh, which obviously doesn't lend itself to a coordinated energy transition. And just here on the right, you can see it's just a little explainer uh, of how many local governments there actually are in Pennsylvania. There's about 1500 townships, uh, almost 1000 boroughs, bunch of cities. Uh, the counties don't really have uh, much kind of legislative jurisdiction. Um, but it is, uh, it's quite a bit, quite decentralized when you're looking at that number um, of local governments, each trying to put together their own rules. So what I want to talk a little bit about today and some of the kind of theoretical frameworks that I'm drawing on and the way Charlie introduced me was perfect that I'm drawing on some psychology, uh, some legal, some engineering, uh, public policy, kind of from all of these di different disciplines to understand how do we build capacity in fragmented systems uh, to enable us to have an equitable energy transition. So part of the theory that I'm working with is the Adv advocacy coalition framework work, which basically says that coalitions emerge in response to uncertainty in, re in response to change uh, to advocate for policy. So these coalitions typically share a particular belief system uh, that is backed by a set of values, uh, a set of assumptions that are shared um, and around a perceived problems uh, around a perceived problem and that they coordinate activity over time. Uh, these coalitions form shared narratives, uh, and through that, they advocate for policy outcomes that align with their beliefs. Um, so in theory, having active, diverse coalitions can help us move beyond uh, what some planners call the decide, announce, defend model, uh, which is when a developer and landowner, uh, whoever the relevant parties are, decide that a project will happen, uh, announce it to the municipality, uh, and then defend their stance because the kind of only option people have uh, then is to show up and say, well, I don't want that to happen. Uh, they just heard about it. Uh, so moving beyond that is kind of the goal to think about a coordinated transition um, where maybe it's less decide, announce, defend, um, but consult, decide, collaborate something along those lines. 
so to this problem, the research agenda uh, that I'm starting to build uh, in Pennsylvania, and then you will extend out um, likely next into Kentucky and hopefully some other sites. But today I'm just going to mostly give an overview of the data that I've collected in Pennsylvania um, that we have to unpack these context specific drivers of collective action um, of what makes people coordinate to make change. Uh, so some of the questions I'm going to address today and then leave lingering for you to wonder about my future research uh, are what attributes of energy projects are important to residents in Pennsylvania, which narratives about energy transitions are the most salient, and which groups, uh, and what social norms and practices do these narratives support? Uh, what are their implications for civic engagement? That's kind of the long run project. I'm going to mostly speak to these first two questions today. So as a part of this larger project, uh, we have this mosaic uh, methodology approach. We're working on online surveys, uh, interviewing a diverse group of stakeholders, uh, and then the plan is to eventually conduct some focus groups uh, and community workshops with what we find uh, in a kind of participatory spirit to actually be able to speak to Ann Langer's mission of engaging beyond academia uh, and being able to help create toolkits um, that can help people who are doing the stuff in practice. Uh, so today I'll talk to I'll speak to some results from the online survey uh, and the stakeholder interviews. So first, uh, and I'm very excited to actually be able uh, to have some data to present. Uh, I'm going to talk you through a conjoint experiment that our team ran. I just want to pull it up to make sure that I get exactly what I wanted to say. I always forget the, the very specifics about it. Um, but basically what a conjoint experiment is, is a survey based statistical modeling technique to determine how people value different attributes. Uh, so people have used conjoint experiments in market research. Uh, you might have ever taken surveys kind of seen like, uh, which phone would you prefer if you were going to buy a smartphone, uh, phone A or phone B with all of these different attributes. So what we did was for different energy projects. And this is not um, just for solar, uh, but also looks at wind, uh, natural gas with carbon capture and storage and nuclear. Um, so through this, we evaluate the impact of 24 different social, political and aesthetic features of energy projects uh, on public support for project development. And the sample is Pennsylvania residents uh, demographically representative on age, gender, income and race, uh, about a thousand uh, and a nice balance um, of urban, rural and suburban respondents. I think, believe it's a quarter urban and rural uh, and the rest suburban. Uh, and so what you see on the right uh, is just one example. Each respondent was asked to do this five times uh, to uh, decide which project they could you know, pick project one or project two based on these different attributes of how many job opportunities it's giving, uh, the project site, distance from residential areas, local project benefits, ownership model, and then of course the type of energy project. Uh, and these are randomized. And then the order of these is also randomized per respondent to eliminate any kind of order effects. So what you see here uh, is kind of an overview of the results that obviously you can't see very well. And I will walk you through uh, in detail in the next few slides, but through a conjoint experiment, uh, what we get, what each of these little dots are, uh, is the average marginal component effect of each attribute compared to a reference category. Uh, so as I'm walking you through this, each uh, average marginal component effect, each dot represents the causal effect of a single profile attribute uh, while averaging over the other remaining attributes. Uh, so like I promised, I will break it down. Uh, in the sample, I also have um, the full sample and then split out by uh, subgroup by political party. Um, so what we found here is that the creation of permanent union scale wage jobs, low impact on wildlife habitat and cooperative community ownership all increase public support for energy projects. Um, so here, uh, one of the kind of uh, more dramatic um, increases uh, is the creation of 50 permanent union scale jobs. And that's compared to the base category of not changing the number of local jobs at all, increases support by an average of 13 percentage points, uh, which is pretty significant. Uh, here we also have ownership, uh, who owns the project, uh, community ownership, uh, a project that's owned cooperatively, uh, moves the needle a little bit, increases support by three percentage points. Um, but what was more interesting to me uh, is that 
uh, overseas ownership. If you say a project is owned by a foreign company, particularly among Republicans, that decreases support for a project by 26 percentage points. Uh, so that has some implications for messaging, right, about who's running these projects. Um, uh, and then we can see kind of across the board, people in Pennsylvania prefer solar. Uh, and wind, but solar increases support across the board by eight percentage points um, uh, and are a little bit more uncomfortable with nuclear, which decreases support by eight percentage points. Uh, and you can see on the right that Democrats kind of have stronger opinions either way, you know, that are, you know, more pro renewable, uh, a little bit more hesitant about nuclear, uh, and while Republicans more kind of cluster in the middle in that kind of spirit of being energy neutral. Uh, so really excited about this work, and this is just kind of the first step. Uh, the next, which is currently in progress, is to repeat an abridged version of this conjoint. So just kind of narrowing down based on what those interesting findings were with a sample of 200 local elected officials in Pennsylvania. Um, so there's this company, Civic Pulse, that maintains a, a sample of local elected officials that they survey, which is uh, just a really difficult thing to do uh, to maintain that kind of sample, to be able to uh, reach local elected officials, but then also provides them with information um, that helps make decisions. So here, we're, you know, we're interested in the same thing as we were with the general population. What attributes did they value? Um, but I think even perhaps even more interesting, we're interested in assessing the concept of pluralistic ignorance, uh, which is the situation in which uh, the minority position on a given topic is wrongly perceived to be the majority or vice versa. Um, you know, so, you know, if I thought everybody here hated me, um, but I was wrong. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting kind of phenomena that we do see with climate, uh, particularly around policy support. Um, uh, in terms of people are kind of across the board, there have been studies that have shown likely to underestimate how much other people support uh, climate policy across parties. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see kind of how local elected officials uh, estimate their constituents support for these different energy projects. Uh, so very exciting. Uh, so next, just briefly, this is all much more preliminary, but I'll speak to uh, what's actually happening on the ground. We've been doing a little bit of field work so far, have completed seven in-depth interviews uh, with activists, labor organizers, and local government officials. Uh, I will be back with my research assistant, Tran, in the field next week doing more interviews. So this is all very ongoing and an iterative analysis process. Uh, so, you know, take this all with a grain of salt. It's in progress, uh, but some interesting findings uh, from some of the interviews that we've worked on. Um, first, uh, in talking to a sample of climate activists, uh, some narratives of extraction have emerged. Uh, in terms of renewables um, having the potential to be just as extractive uh, as any other type of energy industry. So I've pulled some quotes here so that to kind of illustrate um, what some of these sentiments are. And in uh, trying to identify these narratives, um, you know, that's how we're able to kind of then think about how do coalitions emerge? What narratives uh, are they disseminating? Uh, and that will be, you know, the kind of process of the research going forward. So. I had one activist say, uh, and, and these are uh, climate activists, you know, very concerned about climate change, uh, say, I just see these oligarchs as wanting to put a price tag on the sun and then building these enormous centralized and inefficient in the end solar arrays, which are going to chew up previously pristine land. Um, and another with a similar concern said, we're just going to come in and take your land, put some solar panels there, we're going to profit. We haven't figured out what works across the board for everyone equitably and making sure that communities really do invest in the stuff aren't left holding the bag. Um, so you can see, you know, some kind of concern uh, about how equitably uh, this is going to be done. Uh, then on the other hand, uh, in some groups that are very vocal anti-utility scale solar, um, we've seen these kind of preservationist narratives around land use, and this is very particular to Pennsylvania, uh, which has a strong history of being a farming state uh, and having a lot of farming communities. Uh, so what I heard from one local government official uh, was that changing land use has been a huge cultural issue. Uh, and they said, I'm not surprised that they've taken steps to preserve what farmland they have left. Uh, those townships probably lost 80 to 85% of the farmland they had since 1980, and they had a lot. Uh, and the next 
text that I have pulled from uh, the website of PA for Responsible Solar, uh, this quote that they pulled with the image that they provided saying that we believe that true green energy solutions do not involve destroying farmlands, forests, wildlife, habitat, families, and homes. Uh, so you can see those narratives coming out around wanting to preserve land, kind of pristine nature, uh, preserving farmland, uh, and that kind of strong cultural identity that's tied to that. Um, and then finally, kind of in a different vein, uh, is thinking about building coalitions, what existing coalitions uh, can kind of come together to form stronger coalitions. Uh, so we've done some talking with labor organizers because a uh, huge issue in terms of renewable energy, uh, who is going to build it, what jobs is, is, is it going to create? We saw that in the conjoint experiment, uh, creating jobs and economic activity is incredibly important to people and important to communities for good reasons. Uh, so one labor organizer we talked to uh, kind of expressed that disconnect saying that so many people have great ideas, but they're not always talking. You have renewable energy people and they're not necessarily talking to labor people. Maybe now they are, but before they weren't. Uh, so you can kind of see these these uh, coalitions form in real time. Um, and another quote, that's, that's what our whole drive is moving forward. We want to make sure every project, especially utility sized arrays, if there's taxpayer dollars involved, there should be a wage standard. Uh, so making sure that kind of from the start, these strong labor protections are built into energy projects, which we also know, uh, you know, is important to communities uh, and is important to Pennsylvania residents more broadly. So that's some of my, uh, my early findings. Uh, and as for next steps, um, I'm very interested in trying to understand what social norms and practices these narratives uh, both promote and constrain. Uh, so practices in terms of showing up at town hall meetings, having these conversations, uh, talking uh, about the development of renewable energy in communities. I think especially in a local government state like Pennsylvania, this is incredibly important to a transition. Um, do predominant narratives translate to majority beliefs? Uh, it's unclear. Sometimes uh, the loudest voice in the room is not uh, the, what everybody actually perceives to be true. So, you know, how much are these narratives uh, cohesive with what we find when we do, uh, you know, larger sample survey uh, efforts? Uh, and then what new models of engagement encourage productive deliberation that does help move us beyond that decide, announce, defend model um, and maybe towards models that have a bit more productive deliberation. Uh, we talked to one uh, local official that I didn't quote on here, uh, but that talked about a pretty successful project uh, where uh, some it was a small group of residents had some concerns. Uh, they took it to the developer. The developer made concessions. Uh, everybody was more or less happy in the end. Uh, and that was mostly in terms of setbacks, uh, adding some higher vegetation. Um, a lot of the times it's stronger, more detailed plans for decommissioning. Uh, so that kind of give a little, get a little. Um, and then ultimately, the goal is to trace causal mechanisms from project proposal to approval. Um, so how do these narratives, social norms, uh, civic engagement actually form a causal pathway uh, from proposal to approval? Um, and then, like I said, to kind of work in a participatory way uh, with stakeholders to help build toolkits for municipalities uh, and citizens that are concerned that want to be involved and want to do so in a productive way. So picture from Fieldwork, special thanks to Duran uh, for their hard work uh, in the field. Uh, that is a QR code for my website and I'm happy to take questions. The, the, um, the changes in response or, or the changes in support versus up or down. Ray, you said we're to a reference case. What is the reference case that people are deciding? You know, so what they're saying, what they're seeing is five iterations of pick one or two um, that vary on all of these different dimensions. And statistically, we're able to tease that out. So the, the reference category, uh, we can change. It doesn't matter all that much. It's just showing uh, relative to whatever you said as the reference category, is it good or bad? So for some of them, it's a little obvious, like jobs, no changes to number of jobs seems like a reasonable reference category to then compare. Uh, compared to no changes, um, you know, then adding jobs increases support by 13 percentage points, uh, but losing jobs due to retirement of an old plant then all is worse than no 
change. How about, how about something like ownership? So for ownership, we have the default here, the baseline as owned by an American private company. Um, and that's just a decision that we made. Like you can, we can change that um, in, you know, in, in making a graph. But I think that that's kind of just what most people assume um, when there's a project like that it's probably, they might not know, you know, if it's like a local company, or which state, which has kind of come up, um, like particularly in Kentucky. Uh, one of the projects I'm looking at, the developer is local to Kentucky, and that's been kind of a big part of the discourse. Um, but kind of, so compared to if you tell somebody the company's American uh, versus you tell them that it's foreign owned. And we also have in here owned by state government. Um, you know, which is also an arrangement, uh, which seems that, you know, people prefer uh, private ownership and but uh, national private ownership uh, as opposed to international. Is there a, a model or presence of um, utility scale with using the farms that utilizes like a community solar type model? Right. Yes and no. It's uh, I, the community solar is is usually smaller uh, or more aggregated across. So, you know, the, you can have a community solar pro, uh, project that pays for the cost of installation of rooftop PV and then aggregates the energy. Haven't seen many models of really utility scale um, that are community owned. I think you know, not that it's not a possibility. Um, and then also, you know, that ownership variable is also kind of to get a sense of the narrative of, well, we're not even using that energy, which is something you hear a lot. Like they're gonna build this big solar farm, but people in California are gonna use that energy. And it's, you know, obviously more complicated than that, but that is kind of the way that people can feel sometimes. Um, and so I think that's also kind of one way to get it that um, in a kind of community solar, you know that at least you're getting the credits. Right. Um, I'm, I'm not sure if this is like even something you cover in your research or, or if you would have an idea about it, but I'm just curious about the aversion to nuclear in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, do you know if that's kind of like on the line of the rest of the states or just a, because I, I mean, three mile island was in Pennsylvania, right? The, the yeah. and the so I, I'm, I'm just curious if you know if it's more like a Pennsylvania thing aversion or if it's like a, just like everyone, you know. In that would be state. good to have a have this the stat. I in my my gut is that it's pretty aligned. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. So yeah, to, to know that stat, I think would be interesting, just like general perceptions uh, towards nuclear, whether that's Pennsylvania or not. Uh, I, I have a potential response to that, which is that um, in, in Pennsylvania, there's a lot of uh, government subsidy for nuclear. And I've heard a lot of backlash about that specifically. So, and because we still have a few nuclear plants running throughout the state, so that that might be part of it. Yeah, yeah there really is, and that's what very interesting. Like in in one of the counties that I'm looking at, like every single type of energy, um, you know, in in one county that there's solar, there's a little bit of wind, there's still coal and natural gas cogen, there's nuclear. So it's you know, energy rich state. And I think I'm about at time. One last yeah. So, um, to, to what extent is it, uh, it's really notable how how the how policies is locally driven in Pennsylvania and that because it creates you know, it's, it's just slows everything down for how you're going to do this. Point. So, to what extent is that a model? What other states are similar? How many of what portion of the states in the country do you have a sense? Of? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's I think Pennsylvania is a bit unique. Um, I was just, I just had like a little figure and now it's it's a, out of my mind, but I think um, there are a few other states that are, and, and that there's kind of this continuum, right? Of that I think Pennsylvania is one of the most local heavy states, but that some states are like a little bit of a mix. Um, so I think that Pennsylvania is kind of a unique case, but there are there are certainly other states that that follow this model. Well, that's good. I mean, so yeah. you want to study the end numbers? 
Exactly. And so that's what I'm, I'm definitely interested in kind of building out this model so that I can understand kind of, okay, what happens in a state uh, where this is really like state government led, um, you know, where the governor can put something down like this. Um, and then it really happens because, uh, you know, the, the, that the state offices are able to uh, handle siting. Uh, and go through all that. And so it's it's a complicated landscape in Pennsylvania, particularly because in this project, um, you know, it really is state led for this like large utility scale project. Um, but then at the it, it gets down to the municipalities. Um, and that's like the make or break. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Well, I'd like to thank everybody for coming. Um, and again, thank you, Fernando. Thank you, Holly, for wonderful talks. Uh, I'd also like to thank Rob, uh, Ike, my colleague, and my other colleagues, uh, Sarah Jackson and Diana Dudash, who are staff at the Endlinger Center, who, who enthusiastically put their energy into supporting this seminar series. Um, we will have another set of talks next week. Uh, just shown up here, uh, Julie Oivrard and Alison McGoy, who's right here, will be presenting uh, again. It will be on Wednesday with lunch at noon and talks starting at 1230. Uh, we hope you can join us there. Uh, if you, you probably receive an invitation through email. If not, there's a, you can go to our website and go to the research tab and there's a summer seminar series link in there and you'll find a way to register too. So thanks again for coming and hope you guys have a good week. So, so that's what kind of like they were asking. Um, uh, I looked at it. At it but, so it's kind of like in reality for fabrication purposes, they're always going to like that. Like, they're going to post or whatever. But in, in, in Howard's like first paper, of what do we know for? They look a little bit of bar, of course. They do some analysis on the bar, of course. They check on posts. And they do the same order of mind, which is like they're saying, you know, like. Yeah, after you would trade, right? So it's kind of like for other places. I, I like um, to see that's like but longitudinal is kind of like what happens within the fluid state and transverse is what happens over the solid over top, like bridges, which would and, and hopefully that's like, minimize that's the what I'm, I'm trying to, drainage, it would be really but, nice to have like, um, a map. Like yeah, kind of like we, we haven't how, like like I still need to kind of yeah, it, like how um like kind of global or oriented is each shape.